Possessions are pretty normal in people's day-to-day -day lives, you know. Unless someone has achieved total oneness with the universe, we all own different stuff. Private property is a trip. But of course, physical objects in one's possession can't be the topic of the day. We got demons rising up and overtaking people's bodies, minds, and souls to discuss. Could you imagine if this was about things that demons own? Like demon t-shirts or maybe a nice demonic flat screen? Ah, uh, next time. But for now, we're talking about the top five scary demonic possessions. Coming in at number five, we've got Elizabeth Knapp. Granted, around the time of the Salem witch trials, a lot of things may have been interpreted as demonic or paranormal when they shouldn't have been. Just take a look at all of the people accused of witchcraft for patently non-witchy things and you'll see what I'm saying. If someone weighed the same as a duck, that means she's also made of wood. And people burn wood, but people also burn witches, right? I'm getting away from the topic at hand, sorry. 20 years before the start of the Salem witch trials, there was a young woman working for Samuel Willard, a somewhat prominent reverend in Massachusetts. That girl was named Elizabeth Knapp, and she may have been possessed by a demon. A little odd, considering the holy nature of the man she worked for, but that's how the story goes. One October, Elizabeth started to complain of pains all throughout her body, ones that couldn't really be explained. As time went on, these pains increased in frequency and and intensity, so she went to the reverend. She told him that she would often convulse uncontrollably and had many fits of screaming and crying for no apparent reason. It even felt like she was being strangled by an unknown, unseeable force. Needless to say, these behaviors concerned the reverend. Eventually, Elizabeth told the reverend that her ailments all began when she made a deal with the devil. Classic. She somehow got in touch with this underworld overlord and exchanged her soul for eternal youth and exorbitant sums of money. Once these admissions were made, things got much worse. Elizabeth would speak in a terrifying, distorted voice, and it often appeared that the devil was speaking through her. Her body would contort in such violent and grotesque ways that it took multiple people to hold her down. In addition to all of that, her throat also swole up like a balloon, which couldn't have been very comfortable. Unfortunately, nobody really knows what happened to this poor young lad. In the Reverend's journals, all sorts of demonic experiences were detailed, but he eventually conceded that he wasn't quite sure what to do with the girl. He didn't know what exactly was happening to her, but he could tell that the things going on weren't voluntary. Whatever demonic presence had overtaken Elizabeth Knapp was determined to stick around and prevent anyone else from ruining its fun. Coming in at number 4, we've got Bobby Jindal. Most of the time, American politicians don't have too many dealings with the devil. Well. Not publicly anyways, it would ruin their reputation. However, this former governor of Louisiana says he found himself face to face with a demon and even wrote an article about his experience. That's gutsy for sure, especially for a guy who would eventually run for public office and win. Well, it sort of came back and bit him in the ass because he likely could have run for vice president alongside Mitt Romney. And looking back, it becomes increasingly apparent that his dealings with demons put a big hole in his VP aspirations. But enough political talk, let's get to the demon. In his article titled Beating a Demon, Physical Dimensions of Spiritual Warfare, published in the New Oxford Review, Gentile describes his attempts to exercise a demon from his Al Susan. Poor, poor Susan. Apparently, the undergraduate was undergoing treatment for her cancer at the time, and some of the effects made Jindal suspect there might be a demon present. He and a bunch of other Christian college students banded together to perform an impromptu exorcism. They had contacted a preacher to preside over the proceedings, but this holy man told them to hold off on the exorcism. In his article, Jindal questions whether the preacher simply did not want to come over to a college dorm, or if he was worried about the demon potentially being too powerful. In the end, the group of students went through with it, holding Susan down as best they could as she struggled and attempted to escape. Eventually, a student from a rival Christian college organization burst in with a crucifix, and this seemed to work on the demon. When they read Bible verses aloud, Susan screamed profanities and questioned the value of the religion. However, in between these supposedly demonic outbursts, Susan also showed her true face, begging to be rescued from her possessor. In the end, the demon was said to be removed, and Susan was able to return to life as normal. However, Jindal's eventual political aspirations would be cut short thanks to this demonic possession. One has to wonder what would possess him to write his experiences so plainly. <laughs> Coming at number 3 we've got Michael Taylor. This case is a peculiar one indeed. 
Back in the 70s, Michael Taylor was working as a butcher in West Yorkshire. He and his wife had recently joined a Christian fellowship group which Taylor took very seriously. A little too seriously perhaps, as he soon began engaging in what his wife describes as carnal relations with the leader of the fellowship group. Mary Robinson. This didn't sit well with his wife, so she called it out in front of the rest of the group's members. Most people would probably yell something rude and profane and then slink away in embarrassment, but Michael Taylor? He claimed that he'd been feeling evil inside of him and got really mad at Robinson. After this, he requested an absolution but continued to act strangely. This behavior encouraged a local vicar to seek out external help, so he brought in a couple of ministers to assist with an exorcism. This demonic expulsion went on overnight and supposedly supposedly removed over 40 demons from Taylor. However, they didn't get them all. The ministers said that three demons still remained inside. Insanity, murder, and violence. You can probably see where this is going. After this all-night affair, Michael Taylor returned home. During his time there, he ended his wife's life and strangled their pet dog. He was found wandering the streets in a daze covered in blood. Adultery, insanity, then violence. Those must have been some serious demons. Either that or Taylor just wanted out of his marriage, but couldn't think of a better way to go about it. Coming in at number two, we've got George Lukens. Not to be confused with George Lucas. Of all the times one could get possessed by a demon, you would think that a Christmas pageant would be pretty low on the list. You know, celebrating the birth of the holiest of holy figures and all. But poor George Lukens, he couldn't catch a break. He'd been performing at his local pageant and seemed to fall over for no reason. According to Lukens, it wasn't too much eggnog that did it. It was a supernatural force that slapped him, knocking him to the ground. In the following years, Lukens developed a seemingly incurable condition that doctors couldn't explain. He could though, and he said that it was demons. Multiple presences attempting to take over his body. When doctors gave up on curing him, a priest stepped in. He performed an exorcism on Lukens, which became quite the public event. Folks from all over came to see how it was going, and many reported a very disturbing scene, including Lukens claiming that he was the devil, becoming violent, and even barking like a dog. After all this though, Lukens seemed to be cured. The priest said that he sent the demons back to hell and that Lukens was a god-loving person once more. And finally at number one, we've got Clara Germana Selly. If nuns are getting tossed around like rag dolls, it's time to investigate what's going on. And this is exactly the case when it comes to this South African possession. 16-year-old Clara Germana Selly had supposedly made a pact with the devil and used her newfound abilities for evil. She made animalistic noises that chilled the bones of all who could hear them and gained supernatural natural strength. At one point, she even levitated off the ground, only to be brought back by splashes of holy water. Folks aren't exactly sure why she made this deal, but when a 16-year-old starts throwing nuns across the room, you don't try to get to the root of the problem, you try to stop it immediately. The exorcism was a grueling two-day ordeal in which Clara attempted to suffocate the priest multiple times. She spoke languages she couldn't possibly have been familiar with and projected a terrifying demonic voice. Eventually, the demon was exorcised, but nobody involved would ever be the same again. So, making deals with devils doesn't seem so sweet now, does it? Even if the possession results in you getting your hands on some demon's possessions, like a hellish chalice or a hot tub from Hades. Just thought I'd bring back my terrible joke from the intro. So, what'd you think of the list? Do you agree with my picks? What is the scariest demonic possession you've ever heard of? Have you ever met anyone who claims to have been possessed? Make sure you let me know down in the comments. Speaking of comments, let's take a look at some of your more undying ones from the top five people who successfully summoned a demon, part two. Brad Merrillick says, Grant Morrison has a rather interesting outlook on the subject. I agree. Prep for it says, all excellent info, Keegan. I hope you are never serious about those dangerous activities you plan on doing in between videos. Maybe invest in an actual suit of armor to stay safe. I don't know how effective armor would be. Maybe some knee pads and a tactical vest. Witherbloom Warlock says, I'd rather the viewpoint that demons are personifications of aspects of the id, as opposed to just negative emotions. After all, the seven deadly sins are just aspects of the id at their extremes. Fair enough. Maybe we conjure demons simply by existing. And the son of Dormammu says, Gonna guess that Tartini and Justinian are the victims of propaganda by enemies that were jealous of them. I don't really put a lot of store in written history as it is written by humans, and humans are fallible. This could just be the old school version of the 27 Club, or the idea that celebrities work for the Illuminati. Folks do love to gossip. And that's all the time we have for today. I am going to run straight through 10 consecutive sheets of drywall. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.